What's up you guys, Rex here. So that's another week of medical school in the books. This past week, we started learning about kidneys and let me tell you, kidneys are really complicated and amazing. So I wanna eventually talk about something really cool about kidney transplant that I learned. But before we get there, I just wanna talk a little bit about how the kidney works, specifically how a nephron works, which is the like functional unit of a kidney, because it's absolutely amazing. And I encourage you to look up other videos if you're interested, because this will not be comprehensive in any way, but I wanna make sure you have a basic understanding of how the kidney works to understand how incredibly complicated it is. So basically the goal of the kidney is to filter your blood and make urine. So we'll throw up right there on the screen now, you should be seeing a picture of a nephron. So it starts off by having some blood go to something called a glomerulus or glomularis. I don't know, you know, I've had like three different pronunciations from my professors, so we're gonna go with glomerulus. And so what that is, is basically a little capillary network inside of something called a Bowman's capsule. And basically what this is, is it has an afferent arterial where blood is going to it, and then an efferent arterial where blood is going away from it. So just to start with some of the amazing control going on here is this efferent and afferent capillary can be selectively constricted or dilated to change the pressure inside this capillary bed inside this Bowman's capsule. And it can do this both with different signals from hormones or nerves, and it also can just do it by itself in auto-regulation where it's modulating its own pressure. And so it can adjust the amount of pressure in this capillary where there's more pressure, it's forcing more of the plasma and all of the stuff in the blood out into this Bowman's capsule. So inside this Bowman's capsule is filtrate. And that is basically almost everything in the blood besides red blood cells. There's some things that aren't filtered, but basically the general strategy of the kidney is to filter everything and then reabsorb stuff that we actually need to keep. So a ton of stuff is shoved out into this Bowman's capsule and it starts going through a tubule network. First, it comes into the proximal convoluted tubule where a vast majority of this stuff is reabsorbed. So a ton of like glucose, salt and ions and a lot of water sucked back in through the proximal convoluted tubule. Then we get to something called the loop of Henle, which is like an awesome solution to the problem of we need to be able to either have really concentrated urine, if we're trying to hold on to water, or really dilute urine if we're trying to get rid of water quickly. So what the goal of this loop of Henle is, is to create a concentration gradient within the kidney. And so when it is going down, it's called the thin descending limb of the loop. What this part of the limb is, is it is permeable to water, but not permeable to any salt or ions. And so as it goes down the loop of Henle, more and more water is sucked out of the loop. So once the urine gets down to the bottom of this loop of Henle, it's gonna be on the order of over a thousand milliosmolar. And it's starting at like 290 is what plasma in blood normally is. So it's super concentrated. And then on the way up, it is going the opposite way through the concentration gradient where the surrounding tissue is less and less concentrated. And so now it is not permeable to water. Instead, it is permeable to salt. So the salt will keep going out and out and out of the urine to make it less and less concentrated. So by the time it gets to the top of this ascending loop of Henle, it's gonna have a concentration like under or around 100 milliosmolar. And so it's sort of a two-stage process of concentrating the urine. First, we get rid of water, and then we get rid of all of the salt and ions and stuff like that. And what's unique is that it's not really the goal, quote unquote goal, to start concentrating the urine yet. It is to establish a concentration gradient. So then when we now get to the distal convoluted tubule, it goes through after that, there's some more absorption and reabsorption that goes in and some secretion can start happening of other specific things. But once we get to the collecting duct, where we do have some selective absorption of stuff and selective secretion of stuff. But the big thing is that we can modify based on how many aquaporin, which are just water channels are put into it. We can modify how concentrated or dilute our urine is by going down into this collecting duct. Now, if you're thinking carefully about how we did this loop of Henle process, what we would be doing would constantly be like getting rid of our concentration gradient. So the way it's maintained is through the vasa recta, which is a blood vessel that is now traveling through the opposite direction in an anti-parallel to the loop of Henle. So when the urine is going up, the blood is going down. And when the urine is going down, the blood is going up. 
So if we think about this, it's going down next to the thick ascending loop, and so it's carrying all the salt downward because salt is being secreted by this ascending loop. And so carrying salt downward, that's concentrating this gradient of tissue surrounding the nephron. And then the blood is going up when the urine is going down. When the urine's going down, it's secreting water. And so now the blood is picking up that water and carrying it back up the nephron. And so as it goes up, it's getting less and less concentrated in the tissue surrounding it. And so there is a sort of really interesting thing that like, I wouldn't have come up with this if it was my job to design a kidney, but it works incredibly well and it's very complicated and has all kinds of different ion channels and stuff like that. So I just want to talk a little bit about that to make sure you get some idea of how complicated the kidney is and understand that each step along this way, whether it is the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending limb, the ascending limb, thick ascending limb, distal convoluted tubule, collecting duct, all of that stuff, in addition to the afferent and efferent arterial, everything can be modified to change the concentration of urine and change the concentration of specific solutes within the urine that sometimes we need to get rid of stuff really quickly or maintain stuff. So the way our body regulates kidney function is very complicated and very redundant. And so there is a lot of nervous system activity in our autonomic nervous system where we have different parts of our body, such as our aorta and the carotid sinus, which are constantly measuring our blood pressure. And we'll send those signals to the brain, and then the brain can send signals down to the kidney and get things to respond. Additionally, there's a ton of different hormone regulators. And so in the atria of the heart, there is a peptide that can be released in response to stress that then has an effect on the kidney. In the hypothalamus, it's constantly sensing the concentration and osmolality of the blood and it can release ADH or vasopressin. Additionally, the kidney itself has the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which is where it's taking that distal convoluted tubule when it's coming back up from the thick ascending limb and running it right by the glomerulus and comparing the concentration to the original blood. And it can release something called renin, which goes and does a whole pathway with angiotensin, and that modifies the kidney. Additionally, there's a hormone called aldosterone, which is released by the adrenal glands, which actually sit right on top of the kidney, but it just goes into the blood and it finds its way to the kidney, and that can modify the function of the kidney additionally. So there's all kinds of different ways to modify the kidney. And so what this is all leading to, which is super interesting, is when I think of our body like controlling homeostasis and modifying how our organs function, the first thing I always think of is the autonomic nervous system, where there is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is sort of the rest and digest branch, and then there's the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight branch. You've maybe heard of it. And so they just always sort of work. One is trying to do one thing, the other is trying to do the other thing, and it keeps you in homeostasis and balance and regulates all of the different activities that our body is doing. It's much more complicated than just those two systems, clearly in the case of the kidney, but those are the main things I think of. But now, when you do a kidney transplant, you actually don't even need to bother with the nerves. You don't even connect any of the autonomic nervous system to the transplanted kidney, because there are so many different hormones that act on the kidney in response to initial sensors in different parts of the body, from the heart to the brain, to the kidney itself, that the kidney can react very quickly and correctly to all kinds of different situations that our body has to respond to just from being connected to the blood. It just needs to be connected to the blood and it needs to have an outlet, which is called the ureter, to go to the bladder. That's all it needs and all kinds of different systems are always working with the kidney. So since we don't need to connect the nerves, that sort of frees up where we put in a kidney. And this was something that like, blew my mind because I had always just assumed things were done one way is when someone gets a kidney transplant, typically their kidneys aren't removed, but they just receive a kidney and all they have to do is connect it to a blood supply and then have the ureter be connected to the bladder. And so if you think about where the kidney is located is it's sort of deep to all of your stomach and your liver and your large intestine and it's thrown way back in the posterior of 
the upper abdominal cavity. And so there's like a lot of stuff you'd have to get through in order to put a kidney there. So instead, we just throw it down in the pelvis and connect it to the common iliac artery so it's got a really solid blood supply, take its ureter, connect it to the bladder, and it just starts working. It's getting all kinds of signals from hormones and stuff like that. And it's amazing that it's really a matter of like primarily connecting two tubes. I'm sure that there is a lot more nuance that I will learn about at some point if I ever get to learn more about organ transplant. But broadly speaking, for a kidney to work, it just needs one tube going in for the blood to go in, a tube for the blood to come out with the vein that they just connect to the inferior vena cava or another major vein, and it's just one tube in for blood, one tube out for blood, and then a tube out for urine, and that's all the kidney needs to work. It has all kinds of systems impacting it. It has itself impacting it, and it just works. That is absolutely incredible to me. And it's kind of crazy that people that get kidney transplant, they now have three kidneys with their like main new functional kidney just floating around in the pelvis really far from where an anatomical kidney is supposed to be. So that was something really cool I learned this week in medical school. I'll continue to share something cool I learned in medical school every week. If you want to catch my next upload, make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, I'd love to hear about them down below. I'll read and respond to every single comment. And until next time, don't be ordinary, go be great. Mm -hmm.